Well, he is known as the godfather of AI. Jeffrey Hinton has spent more than 50 years researching the technology that is now dominating the headlines. His work helped put Canada on the AI map and made him a sought-after voice in Silicon Valley, including Google, where he used to work. But today, Hinton is growing uncomfortable with the speed at which AI is advancing. He believes there is a very good chance AI's intelligence will surpass that of human intelligence within two decades, a development which would invite a question we've never had to navigate before. What happens in society when there is something smarter than us? It is that existential threat, coupled with the rapidly rising focus on profits over safety, that has led Hinton to the belief governments around the world need to urgently coordinate and force big tech to dedicate more of their massive resources to this pressing issue. We spoke with Hinton in a wide-ranging exclusive interview that will be airing for you over the course of this hour. And we started by asking him about how he became known as the godfather of AI in the first place. Someone called Andrew Ng, a researcher in Neural Nets, um, gave me that title at a meeting in Britain, probably in about 2011. Um, it wasn't intended as complimentary, I don't think. We just had a session where I was interrupting everybody, and I was the senior guy there who had organized the meeting, and so he started referring to me as the godfather after that. It is a reminder as well that you have been leading research in this field uh, for many years now. Can you talk to us just a little bit about the evolution of that research from when you started to where we are today? Yes, so I started as a graduate student in 1972, and I've been working on neural nets ever since, so for just over 50 years. Um, when I started, neural nets was in the doldrums. Um, when I went to graduate school, everybody said, oh, don't do neural nets, they're dead, they'll never work. And um, I just kept working on them because, for me, they were obviously the right way to understand intelligence. And now they work. And now you've been speaking out about some of the risks, the dangers that you yes. see associated with where this technology has taken us. At what point did you feel it would be beneficial to start speaking out a little bit more? So there's many different risks of AI. There's things like lethal autonomous weapons. I've been talking out about that for a while. Um, but in the spring of 2023, last year, um, I began to realize that these digital intelligences we're building might just be a lot better form of intelligence th than us. And we had to take seriously the idea they were going to get smarter than us, and maybe within the next 20 years or so. And so we needed now to think seriously about could we control them. Before that, I thought it would be much longer, and so we didn't need to worry about it right now. And many people still think they're just statistical tricks and they don't really understand what they're saying. I think that's quite wrong. So I came out and focused on the existential threat, that is, the idea that they'll take over from people. Um, because many people were saying it was science fiction, and I no longer believe it's science fiction. And when you say uh, those people who think these are statistical tricks and they're not, can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? So you train a lot of these large language models by getting them to predict the next word. And in the old days, you'd get autocomplete that wasn't that good. And it will predict the next word by keeping a big table of combinations of words. So it, in its table, it would say fish and chips occurs quite often. So if you saw fish and, it would go and look. And in its table, it would find fish and chips is the commonest. Fish and hunt occurs sometimes. Um, but it would predict probably chips comes next and possibly hunt. Um, and it worked by just having this big table and sort of counting how often things occur. That's just statistics. Um, and when people say it's just autocomplete, that's what they have in mind, but it doesn't work like that anymore. Now, the way it predicts the next word is it understands what you said so far, and given that understanding of what you said so far, it predicts what you might say next. And you have to really understand to predict the next word. If, for example, I ask you a question and you want to predict the first word of the answer, you can't do that well without understanding. And so the clever thing is that by forcing it to predict the next word, you force it to understand. And you talked about it being... A neural network. 
and the possibility of it being smarter than us or smarter than us in the not too distant future. What is the determining factor of that? Well, what we know is that as you make these things bigger, they get smarter. So if you take something like GPT-4, which is bigger than GPT-3, GPT-4 is quite a lot smarter. It answers a whole bunch of questions correctly that GPT-3 would get wrong. Um, we know that if you make it bigger still, it's going to get better. So we know that these things will get more intelligent just by making them bigger. But we also know there's always scientific advances. So in addition to them getting more intelligent by being made bigger, we'll have scientific breakthroughs. So in 2017, there was a breakthrough called Transformers, and that made these things much better. And we'll get more breakthroughs like that. So if the technology is getting smarter, uh, and there is that possibility of it being smarter than humans, this is where, I guess, some of the things you've been talking about come into play. What are the, what are the risks associated with that, in your opinion? OK, so how many examples can you tell me about where a more intelligent thing is controlled by a less intelligent thing? Not a long list. Right, not since Biden got elected, anyway. Um, so basically, a mother and baby is the only example I can think of. And evolution put huge amounts of work into allowing the baby to control the mother. She made, evolution made the sound of a baby crying just intolerable for the mother, things like that. But basically, less intelligent things do not control more intelligent things. Now, some people think these kind of intelligences we're making will be very different from us because they didn't evolve. My friend Jan Lecun thinks it's perfectly safe. Um, we'll always be in control because we build them. I don't really believe that. How come? Well, we're going to make agents of them. People are already doing that. Things that can act. And if you want to make an effective agent, it has to be able to create sub-goals. So, for example, if you want to get to Europe, you have a sub-goal of getting to the airport. And you created that sub-goal because that's the obvious way to get to Europe. Now, there's some sub once you give something the ability to create sub-goals, there's some fairly obvious sub-goals it will create, like if it wants to get anything done, the things you asked it to do, it'll be easier for it to do it if it gets more control. And so it will create the sub-goal of getting more control. It could still be benevolent, but that's already a bit worrying. It's also the case that when you have intelligent agents, you'll want to build in self-preservation. You want them to not sort of destroy themselves. And you want them to sort of watch out for things that could um, make them not work, like data centers going down. And so already you've got self-preservation that's probably going to be wired in various various programs. Um, and it's just not clear to me that this won't lead to things having self-interest. As soon as they've got self-interest, you'll get evolution kicking in. Suppose there's two chatbots, and one's a bit more self-interested than the other. The slightly more self-interested one will grab more data centers, because it knows it can get smarter if it gets more data centers to look at data with. Um, so now you get competition between chatbots. And as soon as, as soon as evolution kicks in, we know what happens. The most competitive one wins. And we will be left in the dust if that happens. What does that mean, to be left in the dust? They won't need us anymore. They'll start running everything, because they can just do it much better than us. Initially, it may be benevolent in the sense that, oh, just stay out the way and we'll make things work for you. A bit like a parent and a small child. But you know, the parent lets the small child do some things, but when it's sort of dangerous or tricky, the parent just takes over and does it in the small child's interests. But there's a slippery path from there to not acting in the small child's interests.